You know, one of the reasons that we're not going where we should in God is because we don't dare to believe what God has made possible to us. We all believe that we've got to have a little bit of sin to prove something. Now, I can't believe that when Jesus died and rose from the dead to make us free from the dominion of sin, why we should have to have, each of us, some little particular sin to kind of try to prove we're human. I'm not at all interested in proving that I'm a product of fallen Adam. I'm much more interested in proving that I am a son of the risen Adam. There's a story of the Russian Tsar in 1903 finding a sentry posted on the Kremlin grounds. The Tsar asked why he was posted there. He was just in the middle of nowhere. There was no apparent reason. The sentry could not answer the question. He had no idea why he was posted there. Come to find out, there had been a sentry posted in that spot for 127 years. And it dated back to Catherine the Great in 1776 had been strolling through that area and had seen the first flower of spring and had said, post a sentry right here. I do not want this flower trampled. A sentry dutifully took their post and the flower came and went and the sentry stayed. And for 127 years, a sentry was posted on nothing. The sentry wasn't wrong, the post wasn't wrong, the commission wasn't wrong, the heart, the intention, none of it was wrong, but something vital had been lost. Something really important was lost and something that previously had meaning was now meaningless. When we are talking about foundations of grace and righteousness, it is because there is something very important here, something very meaningful, something critical and crucial. Everything hangs on this. Our life hangs on this. Our understanding of God hangs on this. And we have become so familiar with the vocabulary of Christianity. I can say, what's grace? And you can tell me unmerited favor. I can say, what's righteousness? And you can say, to be in right standing with God. I can say, what's justification or sanctification or glorification? What is substitutionary atonement? We can throw out the vocabulary of Christianity and in varying degrees, depending on your theological bent or your time with the Lord or your understanding of Scripture, we can all defend our little spot. And yet... Some vital connections over time inevitably get lost. Not just over the time of our own life, a few years or decades. Now multiply that times a generation. Now multiply that times many generations and many centuries. We find ourselves going through the rituals and the motions for 127 years of doing something we no longer understand why we're even doing it. What was the flower that was there that's worth guarding? What was the reason for the post? What's the commission? What, why are these words precious and dear? Grace and righteousness. Is life found in them if we understand what it really means and just meaninglessness and ritualism if we don't understand what it means? What we are endeavoring to do is find that precious flower again. Grace Reformation. I'm asking for a Grace Reformation. Give us revolution and reformation, even as Luther had 500 years ago, with one simple with word, one simple word, grace. grace. Oh God, give us ears and eyes. Cause us to dwell in the beauty realm. Cause us to understand the height and depth, the extravagant love, the goodness of the gospel. God, we want the good news to be good to us again. Let a reformation grip our hearts and sweep this land and cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. God, no more tame gospel. No more complicated gospel. No more neutered gospel. Give us the fullness.
promised land of Christ, to become mature sons and daughters, united to Him, having a righteousness not of our own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith according to His magnificent grace. spies don't be the ten spies be Joshua be Caleb God give us this hill country in the church. Where we should have clarity of the story, we have confusion. Where we should have bold proclamation, we lack confidence. Where we should have a leavening influence in society, we either retreat from society or become just like it. And where we should demonstrate love, we judge and condemn. These are all evidences of veering off course from the gospel. Paul is visiting the Galatians and he says, I'm amazed, I'm amazed that you've so quickly departed the good news. Just a few decades later, not even 127 years like the story with Catherine the Great, a few decades and the flower's gone and people are going through the motions and they don't even know what it's about anymore and Paul's passing through Galatians And he's actually the one, it was just even a shorter period of time for Paul, just a few years. And he's saying, guys, I can't imagine, I can't believe that you're so quickly departing him who called you by grace for a different gospel. You're going with a different good news. And the problem with a different good news is it's no longer the same good news. In fact, it's not really even good news at all. Just a few short months and years. There's a a great tendency for us to lose the goodness of this news. There is a great downward drag, a gravitational pull of a religious spirit that so quickly takes the good news and can make it bad news. And without even knowing it, time passes and we find ourselves living under the weight and the cloud and we don't even know why it is until we realize I'm living with bad news. I've lost the good news. Paul went on just a few verses later. He said, I'm so stirred up about this. Paul was very forceful. He was more forceful with the Galatians in his language than any other letter. He said, I don't care if an angel appears to you telling you about some other gospel. Let them be accursed. I don't care what your source is. This is the gospel. The gospel of the kingdom that Jesus preached is the gospel of grace that Paul preached and that was introduced by Matthew with angels saying, it is good news of great joy. And if there is another revelation, even if it should be the highest order, the highest prophet saying, an angel appeared to me and this is the news and it's not so good, let that prophet be cursed and let that angel go back to hell. This sounds like something worth protecting and defending and knowing why we've taken our post, why we've stationed a sentry here and said, don't let this get trampled. How have we gotten here? 2014, so much of the world is Christianized. And I wonder... what we've given them. Wonder what the message we're exporting is. Wonder if they've been brought into the good news 
or merely spared hell. You're a Christian. I'm a Christian. What does that even mean? What does God want? Is the gospel a system of moralism? Is trying to end abortion and sex tra trafficking and poverty? Those are all good things. Are they the gospel? Is the gospel the Republican Party? Holy cow. God help us. See... I bet I could line up 10 different gospels up here. And whether it is compassion for the poor or social justice for the oppressed or the message of salvation for the lost or the fullness of the spirit and the gifts. And the, we could line up any number of messages and I could probably package it in such a way that you'd say, no, that's the gospel. Come on, preach it. And yet, every one of them, to the degree that they have veered even just a little bit from the simple essence of good news that brings great joy, is a different gospel. Accepting a different gospel has led to a fourfold crisis in the church. Where we should have clarity of the story, we have confusion. Where we should have bold proclamation, we lack confidence. Where we should have a leavening influence in society, we either retreat from society or become just like it. And where we should demonstrate love, we judge and condemn. These are all evidences of veering off course from the gospel.